Syrup Leaf, Appendix A, The Gods of Syrup Leaf A lot has been written about the strange and varied pantheon of Syrup Leaf. Here you can find some information on these bizarre but powerful entities. Vox Nihilary wrote, By the way, 64-bit robot is a faithful worshipper of this demented god. Litost is a deity of the Gate of Climaxes. Litost most often takes the form of a male giant bat and is associated with rainbows, the sky, the sun, day, and children. Kennel wrote, The Pantheon of Syrup Leaf. Doran, goddess of wealth, takes the form of a female dwarf and has 11 followers, the most ardent of whom is Royal W. Nur, the special glitter, god of consolation, storms, the rain, lightning, and thunder, takes the form of a male dwarf, and has ten followers, the most ardent of whom are Manic Mole and Swat Jester. Egul, god of the wind, takes the form of a male dwarf, and has eight followers. It has no ardent followers. Moldoth Purple Inked, the Cave of Color, goddess of mountains and jewels, takes the form of a female mountain goat, and has seven followers, the most ardent of whom is Skull Buggy. Avuz Gemtin, goddess of minerals and metals, takes the form of a female dwarf, and has seven followers, none of whom are particularly ardent. Litost, god of children, day, the sun, the sky, and rainbows, takes the form of a male giant bat, has seven followers, the most ardent of whom is 64-bit robot. Lumen, the embraced incenses, god of oaths, marriage, family, birth, pregnancy, and creation, takes the form of a male dwarf, the most ardent follower of whom is Goldyas. Atith Poemhum, god of festivals, revelry, music, dance, longevity, and youth, takes the form of a male dwarf and doesn't have any particularly ardent followers. Imketh Singed Banners, god of fortresses and war, takes the form of a male dwarf, has four followers, and doesn't have any particularly ardent followers. Dakas, goddess of light, takes the form of a female dwarf and has one follower, I'm Lemon. Gods with no followers, Ostesh, the sadnesses of silence, god of misery, torture, games, luck, and gambling and Teethleth Owl Curses, the Nightmares of Twilight, God of Treachery. Sarkos wrote, When Nur the Special Glitter created the dwarves, he wanted them to be in his image, chaotic and maddening, embodiment of the storm. But such an idea reminded Moldoth Purple Inked, the Cave of Color, too much of the despised humans. And as Nur cascaded his meteoritic spawn down upon the planet, Moldoth Purple Inked hacked apart the flat, rocky lands they were to lay upon to create a mountain mightier than all other mountains. This, Moldoth declared, would be called Mountain Home. And the first dwarves crashed into the mightiest mountain and burrowed deep beneath where they gestated for eons, taking upon the stalwart traits of their cocoon, until finally they emerged, molded of rocky bodies, sinews of magma. Nur was angered mightily by Moldoth's actions, and cursed the mountain the children were buried in, that they would hate the sunlight and be trapped beneath a stone forever. But the mountain was alive, Growing in awareness, the mountain home had attained its own sentience, and it stole the curse from Nur and turned it into a mantle of godhood. It called itself Avos Gemtin, and fashioned an image for itself of a female dwarf, its dominion, minerals and metals, and its role, the dwarf mother, the mountain home. Pieces of the curse seeped through still, and any dwarf who has spent too long inside will become sick at the sunlight. Deeran wrote, Funny, I went a completely different route. Ah, oh, well, who says the dwarven philosophies have to agree, though? Listostians believe differently than Neolites, after all. A Treatise on the Glory of Litost. Taken from the musings of Eurist Uzgobavuz whilst in Play Palace. Volume 18. Praise be to Litost, great and mighty. Dwarven kind has long been a race that lives beneath the surface, 
cleaving soil and stone to our will, and plundering the treasures of the land from Avos Gemtin's very womb. In our race's hubris, we have forgotten much of the mighty power of Litast, eyeing the great light with suspicion. Indeed, if we turn our face from him for too long, when we gaze upon him we are stricken with nausea and disorientation. Too many take this as a sign that the light is evil, without truly understanding. Litas' glory is overpowering and sustaining. How do you think the Upper Lands become so lush with life? Why only the dwarves and our bloodsworn enemies clamber down into the folds of the earth? Litas was once sealed within the earth, and the surface world was as cold and dark as the deepest depths of our mountain homes. However, long before even the Age of Myth, a civilization of dwarves freed him from his glowing prison beneath the mountains, and he ascended to the sky, his massive form and the force of his will freed at last. He charged the dwarves to explore the depths of the lands, to free any other imprisoned gods, and to serve as his emissaries to the underworld. However, our promise to him has long been forgotten, but he has not forgotten us. He still exacts tribute from us in his own fashions. Tell me, what is it that every dwarf has in his gut? Alcohol. A true dwarf is so suffused with it that the sacred fumes waft from him in waves, ascending to the heavens to Litast, where he drinks his fill of the vapors. However, too many dwarves have forgotten this duty, sequestering themselves where the fumes cannot escape. So when they gaze upon his face after years in the Underlands, Litast takes his tribute, and the interest owed by force. He strikes them with nausea, and forces them to vomit forth all the alcohol in their gut, the vomitous a tribute to him. It is in this manner that he gains his lost tribute, and great movements of dwarves to plunder the dead are considered banquets for him. I myself, as a true believer of Litast, have begun to vomit up my daily meals of kitten steaks and wine as tributes to him, once I have absorbed enough alcohol to keep me lucid. It is a practice I encourage heartily, for I have never been in such good shape. Skullbuggy wrote, Of Moldoth Purple Inked, The Cave of Color. Moldoth rose from the ground as massive quakes ripped through the earth. Her eyes shone like finely cut rubies, and her horns made of polished diamond. Her two cloven hooves glittered with gold, and her fur glinted in the sunlight. The dwarves looked up at Moldoth and beheld the gigantic being, and Moldoth looked down at them. Why have you summoned me here? Moldoth asked, in a voice that boomed like thunder. Please, said one of the dwarves, give us a place to live. The humans have claimed the plains, the goblins have claimed the badlands, and the elves have claimed the forest. We've no place to go. And Moldath pondered how to help the dwarves, and how to create a home for them. And then it was decided that they would live within the earth. So Moldath took a hoof and drove it into the ground, and the earth did shake and tremble, and, like a miracle, the ground rose into the sky, peeking high into the clouds. And Moldath turned to the dwarves and said, This is a mountain. There will be many others like it, but this will be yours. It will be where you will live, where you will die, where your sons and daughters will be born. You may mine ore from within its core, and you may smelt whatever metals you may find, for it is yours. And Moldoth drove another hoof into the ground, and mountains did rise all over the globe. Thank you, Moldoth, said a dwarf. Need we know anything more? Yes, said Moldoth. Many dangerous creatures may live within, so be prepared to fight them off. After all, I may have created these mountains, but I have no knowledge of what lies inside. And Moldoth did return into the ground from whence she came, and the earth did seal itself up, much like it did before. And the dwarves carved homes into the mountainside, and as the years went by, the dwarves did create a massive, thriving colony, and it was called the Caves of Color, and it was splendid. And many others made colonies like the Caves of Color, and these were known as Mountain Homes. And the Mountain Homes thrived. And those pussy elves and their faggoty fucking trees can kiss our ass because mountains are fucking kick-ass. The End.
on the batty form of Litast. The world was not always filled with special glitter and pretty things, with pansy greens and fluffy bunnies. Litast is a creature of the dark, realizes a dark spot in the sky when he manifests himself to the world, blocking out the sun once every however long a solar eclipse takes. For in ages past, when Litost was in the tomb before being freed by the dwarves, he was an angular, leathery creature, and while he was imprisoned, the darkness was freed. But when Litost was freed, the darkness poured back into him as if into a great vacuum, and the world was filled with light, and beautiful things began to grow, and the hated elves began to worship this beauty, began to envision the sun as a delicate or perhaps majestic creature, when the very concept of majesty and delicacy is alien to the worldly tossed came from. There, there was only impressive terror. When Litost lets his power run free, the light lingers in the sky as the sun. When he wishes to make himself known to the world, the world darkens for a day, and his terrors arise. When the dwarves begin to forget their bondage to Litost, he captured a passing caravan of humans and mutated them horribly with unspeakable deeds, sending them down as batmen to scare the dwarves from their caves that they may tribute the alcoholic vapors and Litost may sup. I still need to figure out where the children and rainbows come in, though. Kennel wrote, here's some translations for first names. Doran equals diamond. Nur equals late, Eagle equals control, Avaz equals mine, Moldoth equals avalanche, Litost equals torch, Lumen equals chest, Atith equals straw, Imketh equals just, Dikas equals color, Ostesh equals mess, and Teethleth equals rumor. Iba wrote, Nielsen posted, the question remaining is, what forms adamantine in the first place, and why does it have this strange strand structure? Adamantine was used to imprison the demons in prehistory. This is the actual Dwarf Fortress explanation. I'm imagining some sort of Titanomachy-style gods versus demons battle in the mythological past. Edit. Diren posted, that, or when Lumen got jiggy with Moldoth slash Avus, not all of the Union became dwarves, if you know what I mean. But that doesn't rule out this origin for the material. H hey, this is pretty tame compared to some real myths. Sarkos wrote, On the dawning of the sky, And lo, as Nur did beat his stone all over the faces of the mountain gods, whilst Doran videotaped, Litost looked down in disgust, and sent the light cascading down to reveal their actions to his husband slash wife. But Nur was a quick thinker with a devious mind, and he enabled his metallic payload to sparkle and shine in the light, to glitter, one might say, and thus created the first rainbow. And when Nur leapt back into the sky, he smiled knowingly at Lee Tost, fuming with rage, and told him, I will make the rains now, and forevermore your light will produce the badge of my victory over you, a reminder of how I beat you at your own game. And thus, the rainbow to come after the storm was born, a mark of delighted sunlight to the dwellers of the world, but truly a strike of anger by the bat godly Tost, who could do nothing to stop it. On the Children of the Sky But Lee Tost was no fool. He, coming from the darkness, was as cunning as Nur the Special Glitter. He knew that, in spite of Nur's misgivings, his dwarfy children were still precious to him, and he carried them off from within their dreams to the world of rainbows and sent his own batty children to swoop down and whisk them away during the daylight when the rainbow was highest and brightest, making the dwarves fear the rainbow. The children revere it. Yet Latos did not harm the children, and they were always returned safely. Litost became as a saint among the dwarves, feared but also revered at the same time. Feared for the harsh sunlight and the terrifying darkness, revered for the love of the children. And at the same time, the symbolism of the act of bringing children to the rainbow was not lost on Nur, who could do nothing to prevent his actions, lest he arouse the suspicions of his husband slash wife Lumen as to the true nature of the rainbow. And so Litost had his worship 
and his vengeance, and became known as the horrible Bat God of rainbows, children, the sky, and the sun and daylight. I had no idea this would get as dirty as it did. Darren posted, I thought Lumen was the god of creation. Edit, this is the worst Bukaki ever. Crap, for the longest time I read Lumen as female because of the post about Nur and Lumen getting married. So I gathered that Nur would be the, uh, the, the sauce of adamantine. Maybe Lumen holds such acts to be more sacred though, whereas Nur is more of a devious god and Lumen would never, um, splooge on something just for fun. Or, or, or maybe everything Lumen's precious seed touches becomes alive, so he spills it sparingly, lest it overrun the world. And yes, I agree, this is a horrible Bukaki. Diren wrote, Sorry for the double post, but I just got done with a grand unifying mythos for the DF worlds. It hardly covers everything and is easily open for debate. This represents, as it says, orthodox narrating. Feel free to ignore bits of it if you'd like when making your own tale. In the beginning, Lumen the Embraced Incenses cast forth a land, laying the rocky orb into the world. However, his efforts exhausted him, so he delegated the creation of the races to the other gods. Lumen proceeded to sleep for centuries. You may call it sloth, but let's see you make several kilotons of matter out of whole cloth and not want to take a fucking nap. The other gods bickered amongst themselves as to whose children would live where. Sir Prancibald, father of the elves, claimed the forests. Odin claimed the plains for humanity, and so on and so forth. Soon, there was simply not enough room for everyone's creations to fit. Litast the Cunning, bat god of fire and demons, had staked his claim across most of the land, and all of the sky. He had the world in his iron grip. However, his lieutenant, Teeth Left the Nightmares of Twilight, struck a deal with the other gods. Litast and all of demon kind, except for Teeth Leth, would be sealed deep beneath the living earth, far from the touch of the creations of the gods, and the gods would give Teeth Leth dominion over the void beyond the skies. The other gods agreed, and Teeth Leth made his move. Litast was struck down and hurled into a glowing pit with his children, many of Teeth Leth's servitors falling with them to ensure their defeat, and the world swallowed them whole bound with the very life essence of Lumen himself donated in his sleep. Demonkind would forever hate the star spawn, and the factions of hatred would eventually splinter, commingle, and interplay long enough to lead to the civil war that led to the creation of Holistic Detective, the Unholy Maw. Soon enough, the world was populated, only a few wretched lesser deities unrepresented. Lumen's sleeping drool reigned across the orb, giving watery nourishment to plants and filling the seas. The sacred spit soon gained a measure of sapience and called itself Nur, Lake, in admission of its original duty. The many creation myths begin to branch at this point, if they hadn't already. Doranites say Lumen awoke and had sex with the closest goddess, Doran, and their children became dwarven kind, full of life and love of wealth. Orthodox Nereids say that Lumen took a fancy to Nur when he awoke, seeing himself in Nur's image, and miraculously became pregnant with Nur's child, who would become the first dwarf, and the origin of the first crossbow marriage, once Lumen found out. Revolutionary Nereids believe in the myth of Nur's sole creation of the dwarves, and Moldath's curse upon them to hate the sun. There are many, many interpretations, but for this text we shall expound upon Orthodox Nerity. Dwarves, being late to creation, were denied access to the lands of the other races, and were turned away constantly. Soon, they went to one of the goddesses who denied to make a creation on the land. Moldoth purple inked. She heard their pleas and created the great mountain homes, the Cave of Color for them, pledging to become a patron of dwarven kind. Seeing their chance, King Torg of Kobold Kind, Anansi of the Cave Spiders, the nameless Thieven King of Goblin Kind, and dozens of other gods scurried into the mountains and caves created in the aftershocks. However, they were met with a new force, Ava's Gemtin, newly born goddess of gemstones and precious minerals. Ava's hurled as many of the vermin out as she could, but some hid deep in the blood of the earth while others hid in chasms so deep they could feel the heat of the demon pits. 
This is why monsters lurk within mountain homes and canyons, and yet goblins and kobolds are forced to live half-lives in towers and caves. The mighty dwarves of the Cave of Color soon made an underground empire, masters of their domain. They soon discovered Lumen's gift, Adamantine, and followed it to its source, the first demon pit. Demons, driven insane by their imprisonment, surged forth to destroy all the dwarves had built, but one dwarf stood in their way, in the tiny hall that led into the pit. St. Einketh singed banners held the line, slaughtering demon after demon with his mighty hammer. The hammer eventually shattered, and Einketh drew his sword and continued on. Imketh slaughtered thousands of the Hellspawn, eventually going through every weapon the fort had ever made. Once his final dagger broke, Imketh began to break the demons with his bare hands, hurling them back into the pit as they crawled out. Eventually, Litost himself emerged, looming above Imketh, and dealt him a lethal blow. However, Imketh's final action was to flying tackle Litost into the pit once more, the flames consuming him whole. His sacrifice was not in vain, for Litos smashed his head against the lip of the pit and fell unconscious for a year and a day. When Litos emerged once more, he had changed. A beacon of light, changed by the heroic actions of Saint Imketh. He thanks the dwarves of the Caves of Color and ascended to the skies he had lain claim to so long ago, a shining disk in the heavens. Before, the world had been dimly lit by a faint glimmer of the distant gods, but Litost's light shone on the world. This is when Litostinism was formed, a multiracial religion that kindly glosses over its master's demonic origins through ignorance, claims of reform, which have mostly shown to be true, or willful suppression. At least they preach the destruction of the Madden demons and star spawn. Soon afterwards, the epic legend of Nur's orgy with Moldoth and Ava's and Litas' foiled revenge came to pass. Litas began to take dwarven children to the rainbow, his response to Nur's insult. One in particular caught his attention, a sweet child named Dakoth. He was so enchanted by her childlike wonder that he bestowed upon her his dominion over light, and she became Saint Dakoth. To this day, she rides atop Latost as he soars through the skies, looking over the world laughing with eternal wonder at its beauty. The event commonly recognized as the start of reliably recorded history was the creation of Atith Poemhum. Lumen, growing bored with Nur, decided to have a bit of fun. He created a clone of himself and had his way with himself. Nur, enraged at the betrayal, murdered the clone with a bolt of lightning. Lumen, enraged at being interrupted, cursed Nur and his storms to be unable to move under their own power. Floating heavily in the sky, Nur belched forth Egil of the Wind, his eternal valet, in response. Lumen gathered up the charred adamantine covered offal of his clone and sewed it together into a new form, his true child, Atith. Eternally young and eternally partying, Atith is an incredibly common choice of worship among both young and old dwarves. In fact, the party he threw to celebrate his existence is the first commonly accepted event in multiracial history. However, this is not the end of the creations of the dwarven pantheon. I hardly need to tell you the horrible tale of boat murdered. However, Dark whispers have emerged that the final inhabitant of the fortress, the feral child Dodok Aslumash, eventually became so consumed by her grief and hate that she gained a spark of divinity within her, taking upon her the name Ostesh, the sadnesses of silence, playing cruel games with those she comes across, casting them into nightmare worlds and manipulating the lives of leaders to drive them mad. She wishes to see the entire world flooded with magma, as her forefathers did. Of course, them's only rumors. Skullbuggy wrote an excerpt from Why There Are Gems in the Mountain and Other Moldathian Myths by Zog Mengigem, great scholar and archivist. And lo, did Moldath look upon the mountains, and she did say, This looks pretty good, but the dwarves were not happy. Moldoth, the dwarf said, while we're glad you made us such a nice mountain, we're a bit worried because we haven't got much to work with. And Moldoth was surprised. Did I not just make you an entire place to live in? I mean, come on! 
said Moldoth. You can at least be happy about that, you ungrateful halflings. Dwarves, corrected the dwarves. Look, I know what I said, said Moldoth. And Moldoth did sigh and return to the surface world from her great cavern under the earth. And Moldoth did look at the dwarves, who were all so unhappy. Oh, Moldoth, thank goodness you're here, they said, on their knees in prayer. Make this quick, said Moldoth. All right, all right, said the dwarves. But the, the problem is, we've not got a lot of things inside the mountain, like, at all. And Moldoth was flabbergasted. Are there not rocks in there? Well, yeah. And are there not minerals in there as well? Yes, there are minerals. And are there not metals even? There are metals, my lord. So what's the big problem? Moldoth asked, clearly aggravated. You've got plenty to work with, and then some. Why can't you just make do with those for Armak's sake? Well, uh, the thing is... The dwarves hesitated for a bit for, before continuing. All that stuff is quite nice, but it doesn't... It, it doesn't have a certain... Je ne sais quoi. Quit speaking gibberish and tell me what you want, said Moldoth. I'm a very impatient woman. Goat. Woman goat. And the dwarves did mull it over for a bit. And because Moldoth was rather impatient and was fidgeting with nearby trees, they came out with it. We want things that glisten in the moonlight. We want to have it sparkle all over for our arts and crafts and armors and weapons and instruments. We want, well, uh, there's no name for it yet, said the dwarves, but we want whatever you're going to call it. Moldoth groaned. Well, if you insist, I can try a little something. And Moldoth did take a cloven hoof fashioned of the hardest diamonds and cut her wrist open. And blood did spill from her wrist and into the mountains, glittering and twinkling as it fell, like stars dropping from the sky. And Moldoth's blood did harden and settle into the rocks and stones, and thus were created jewels and gemstones. And Moldoth did heal herself back up, and she did ask the dwarves, What do you think? Wait, you mean we have to dig for it? Well, yeah! I assume, since you live in the mountains, that you could have just dug for them. Come on! Really? Moldoth did grunt as it. Look, I'm done doing favors for you topsy-turvy tipplers. Moldoth did then burrow back into the ground and retreated into her lair below the earth. See if I do you jackasses anything nice ever again. And that's why we have to dig for these really tiny clusters of gems deep within the mountain homes. But whatever. At least we get to decorate our bone flutes and tiny, tiny goblets with them. The end. Sirocco wrote, And if you thought Latas was ridiculous, be glad you're not a sand raider. Kidai, Apihai Shizuhoju, Ihukoichi. Kidai, the misty shore of spray. Kidai, the misty shore of spray, was a deity that occurs in the myths of the Big Silence. Kidai was most often depicted as a male muscle, and was associated with fish and fishing. Also, my new fortress is called Joyous Rack, and I approve immensely.